dear friend welcome in this week's video which is called the whatever body we are going to talk today about the public secrets of what we nowadays call energy medicine a very popular topic and one that is actually missing in the list of all topics that i already have within the downland uh, program uh, because my general standpoint is that chinese medicine uh, doesn't have any notion about uh, energy and you can see that in the research that's being done in the, in, the, in the research departments of Chinese medicine they look for instance at neural patterns they look at uh, all kind of uh, physics thermodynamic uh, concepts but they do not relate necessarily to what Western people usually call energy uh, in uh, Chinese medicine or in you know in tailing uh, fields uh, such as uh, healing and so on and so on. We are going to talk about this topic today. We talk about uh, a little bit about the history of energy medicine actually and we are going to explain a little bit uh, part of the growth and um, why uh, as a result of the conclusions of this uh, growth in that field. Uh, we can say that uh, Chinese medicine when talked about uh, in energy um, it is no more Chinese medicine but it's actually Western medicine and as a result of that uh, follows a completely different ideology. This is of course a video about how theory actually uh, creates results. Um, the reason why I talk about this it has to do partly with our uh, fast track program that is the instructor courses that people can do. They can follow these instructor courses and within a relatively short time they can learn a skill like in uh, Taoist fitness or in uh, Taoist yoga, or in uh, uh, qigong, or in tai chi chuan, short form, or in uh, self massage, in uh, massage, uh, twina, uh, ammo, and also in uh, uh, rejuvenation, acupuncture, and losing weight, uh, body form, establishment, sports uh, medicine, and trauma medicine. And these are things that are all easy to learn because trauma medicine that's basically dry needling and uh, you know dry needling you don't need to study for that uh, medicine people they study for two three days and then they are practitioner uh, as if it is that easy but when we talk about these things uh, we have to come first to uh, four different kind of uh, remarks that are important first of all um, in my videos i try to explain uh, many times that Chinese medicine has no place for the concept of energy and the reasons that I give are historical uh, they have nothing to do with what is happening with TCM uh, that means that the, 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 the Chinese medicine that is propagated by the Chinese government or the modernized medicines from Japan, Korea, Vietnam uh, and even Mongolia uh, because all these kinds of medicines they are well they are trying to comply with Western medicine research standards and they are not necessarily in accord with uh, history. So let's delve into these kind of things in a moment. The second part is that I do not wish to make a skeptic, skeptics video. Even I, I have been starting my career in energy work myself. So I do know where people come from. I know how they get into there. And I do know that uh, the intention of people very often is very good. And uh, their results sometimes are, you know, wobbly. Uh, because there's not very much registration of actual results so they don't keep really track of the validity of their work and this is also a reason why they don't get any proper recognition this is usually how it goes with a lot of people when they talk about all the successes that they have sometimes they even claim the successes just to people who have been there and that doesn't mean necessarily that they were actually successful uh, as a professional deformation I keep track because you know I try to improve myself so I always make notes and as a result of that uh, I continuously go through my standards and uh, see what is actually working in Chinese medicine in, as a rule it is normal to make notes for your clients um, but if people really do research on the basis of that that is a completely different kind of question then the third part or the fourth part actually is that uh, the idea the notion of the energy body is relatively new uh, as a concept and uh, we will go into that uh, in this uh, video actually and how it came about and uh, I have to thank uh, Wouter Hanegra for that professor at the uh, University of Amsterdam for bringing up that ID and explaining uh, in colleges uh, what actually was the ID behind that uh, and how that came about 
and I borrow in that sense part of what he said and some parts are based on my own research and the research of other people. Uh, in essence, uh, I would consider energy medicine a pseudo-esoteric scientism, uh, a scientistic effort, and uh, you have to let that word sink in, uh, because after this video you will understand this, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. Pseudo-esoteric scientism uh, suggests skepticism. Um, I just like to point out general trends, and the more we get into the development of the history of uh, energy body things, you understand uh, more closely where it comes from. Um, I do not uh, deny the success of some people. I do not deny uh, the fact that it works, but I like to say something about theory and outcomes, and that's basically uh, it in this video. And I like to compare that. Uh, over time, I am pretty sure energy body people will find the tools to actually make what they say more valid and then uh, find acceptance as a general medicine. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. For Chinese medicine, I don't know yet because Chinese medicine makes itself irrelevant by using Western concepts. Uh, because at that moment it is no longer Chinese medicine and I would advise any practitioner or any student of Chinese medicine to go against that and try to avoid the word energy uh, to make sure that it remains relevant as what is called the Chinese medicine. So that means you really have to do cultural studies to understand what it is about. And no, it is not enough to do a study at uh, the Confucius Institute about Confucius or learn Chinese language in itself, because modern Chinese language is not Chinese language anymore. It is just like Japanese language. It is an innovative language. And it's an innovative language to try to confirm the modern political goals of the state of China or Taiwan or Japan or Korea, you know, all these languages, they're all modernized on the basis of Western So influence. when we established the idea that the uh, concept of energy and energy body as a result is a Western concept, uh, we can do away with some of the fake beliefs that uh, energy concepts are already part of Chinese medicine or Indian medicine or African medicine or Australian medicine for a long, long time. If there's anything comparable to energy, and it is uh, light or sound or something like this, uh, but they there were no notions about energy. There were light, sounds, uh, perception, and so on and so on. So all the ancient techniques that were based on visual and auditory and uh, uh, smell-based uh, perception, and maybe taste in some cases, uh, so that is not exactly the same like energy. We can translate these things nowadays to energy values, but it doesn't mean that they were aware of these kind of things in the past. So that is a major, major stumbling block in believing anything that people say about the past. So whatever they say now, they can say like, okay, they were right at that time, but they based it on a truth that had nothing to do with the truths that we see nowadays. So you can't compare them, you can't mix them. If you mix them, that is called universalism. And that means that everybody always knew everything at the same time, all the time. So that means that people in the Stone Age actually already knew about quantum physics. And that is just uh, plainly not right. Although there are video channels on YouTube who make that claim. But okay. Make it. Uh, not to get too much conspiritual, we can see that there is a clear beginning. And the clear beginning is uh, in the fact that in the 18th, 19th century, people started to become de-Christianized. Uh, because of the influence of science, partly, they put things in doubt. They had the evolution theory, had, uh, uh, well, the theories of thermodynamics, and so on and so on. Uh, somebody like uh, Anton Mesmer came with the idea of animal magnetism as being actually the physical manifestation of the divine fluid, uh, or pleroma, from God. And he tried to explain exorcism as a scientific process and uh, accidentally created hypnosis, he created psychology by accident, uh, initiated the creation, he didn't create it himself. And he also created uh, a large part of what we nowadays call modern esoterics. Modern esoterics in that sense is based on the affirmation that modern science actually also has a spiritual component about itself. And 
Of course, people are spiritual, that's true, but it doesn't mean that the things that we do are necessarily spiritual. Science in itself is a neutral thing, uh, religion in itself is a neutral thing, it depends on the person who is the receptor, what actually comes out of it. If somebody is religious and becomes a very devout uh, Muslim or Christian, and another person uh, starts killing politicians or starts throwing bombs, and so on and so on. We start our story with uh, Charles W. Leadbeater. He was one of the founding uh, figures, major figures in the formation of what is called the Theosophic Society. And the Theosophic Society was a sort of a merger between uh, neo-Catholic uh, thought and mixed with some scripture from India. Of course, these scriptures from India were the result of colonial uh, activities and colonial thought, and the colonial thought actually uh, helped to interpret uh, Indian things in a way that also gave birth to what is called modern yoga. When the Indian army presented yoga to the world, uh, it did so on the ideas of uh, people like Joseph Ledbetter, um, who basically uh, came with his colonial mind to India to research all kinds of things. Uh, he did, discovered uh, Krishnamurti, and there's some concept about these things I'm not going to go into right now. In the same period, uh, he came up with the idea of auras and chakras. And the aura uh, is like an emanation of a person, which is based on the middle-aged English concept of breeze. And that is an experience of somebody who is near you, that you can feel like somebody is near you like uh, somebody thinking about you, like I have with some people sometimes that I feel they're thinking about me, I feel them near me, that's called a breeze. In Islam you have a similar kind of concept, so it is not something that is only from England, it is actually a relatively universal concept. And it is, of course, related to the feeling of wind, and, <laughs> and you sometimes have a shiver on your back and you think, like, oh, something's walking over my grave, that's what they say here in the Netherlands. And that's maybe in your country the same, uh, because you feel somebody's thinking about you. And uh, Let Peter never used the word energy. In later interpretations, just like with Rudolf Steiner, there was rewriting taking place to make it more adaptable to modern readers. And then you see sometimes that the language is changing. But in the original text, there's no mention of the word of energy. Um, he explained the aura as the work of uh, devas, uh, which is a concept that he found in Indian scripture. And as a result, that was sort of like a divine uh, effect of the devas doing their job. He combined it though with the concepts of uh, chakras. And the chakras he described, not completely unlike some schools in India, but uh, interpreted, uh, interpreting it in his own way, in the form of geometrical patterns, which are located in particular kind of places of the body. And you have to project them inward uh, to be able to change your morality. So without this projection, each morality was not there. In uh, Tibetan traditions, uh, you see that they project in some of these places uh, the, the characters. Uh, it is not meant that you visualize these characters, although you can do that to help yourself as a part of meditation. But the idea is that you become aware of that sound inside yourself because it helps to relax the sphincter muscles in these kind of places. And also in Indian yoga, originally the chakras, they were the places where there are sphincter muscles inside your body. And these openings and closings they make uh, to a large degree how tense your body is. And also the passage of food, of course, because they're mostly to do with food. And of course your eyes are sphincter muscles. And uh, your throat that you talk with also is a sphincter muscle. So uh, it is all very, you know, common sense, these kind of things. His ideas were based on his personal experience of these things. So he read these things, he had a personal experience, and he based his science on that. Of course, a science based on the experience of one person is not really a science, but it's an opinion, it's a feeling, and it's an intuition. It might be right, it might be wrong, uh, but, you know, many big religions started with the thoughts of one person, like a Buddhism, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, and, uh, now yeah, you can mention a whole lot of uh, these kind of things, Confucianism also, same. And it is the interpretation of this one person later on that actually made it an important thing. So you can say that Leadbeater, in a way, made a karmic wheel rolling and it started working. Uh, very famous uh, and influential followers were uh, somebody like uh, Joe, uh, Rudolf Steiner and Edgar Cayce, a very famous medium, uh, who also used his theories to explain the things that he did. So this is how Leadbeater actually made school outside of the circles of his own followers. 
and how the Theosophic Society gradually gained influence. Nowadays, the Theosophic Society isn't a very big thing anymore, but it is still around. You can still find the website. We look further down in time, and it's already quite a lot of time uh, later. You see, in the 1980s, there was uh, this uh, fellow called uh, Christopher Hills. Christopher Hills wrote a book um, where he slightly adapted the concepts of uh, Leadbeater, and uh, he also had an experience of one uh, where he adapted these ideas and he saw the chakras as uh, sort of uh, centers in the body that emanated light and you see therefore that this idea is relatively new in the 1980s and uh, as a result of that uh, new schools of thought came about and as a reaction on that. In the same 1980s following that there were healers stepping up uh, their, their tone uh, explaining that they were able to uh, resolve blockages uh, in both the aura and the chakra so that your feelings could go further. And where uh, Leadbeater was still claiming that the yantras would actually uplift your moral nature through which you became a better person and as a result that could find transcendence. Uh, here in this case it was just your energy that had to be changed and then your personality would change and so on and so on. The root of that kind of feeling comes originally in the new thought movement from the 19th century. And uh, this was an American movement on which uh, neoliberalism and uh, you know, neoliberalism, consumerism and so on and so on, they're all based and uh, they come with the idea that uh, through positive action you can create success, you know, the American dream or the American nightmare we can nowadays call it. When you look at that uh, same feeling that uh, gradually uh, evolved and in the 1960s you slowly started having this idea of uh, uh, new age movement where people felt they were like an incarnation of Native Americans uh, and uh, other cultures, they had all kind of influences, uh, LSD, uh, marijuana, mushrooms, uh, stuff, anyway. And as a result of that, you know, you get a whole new line of thinking which was sometimes coherent, sometimes not so coherent, emotionally embedded and uh, gradually gained traction in the late 1970s when popular movements um, became uh, more commercial and uh, aligned themselves with neoliberal ideas about commerce and then at that moment healing became a business and uh, of course then of course you get this cycle of innovation uh, through which new schools of thought, new schools of action come about like crystal healing, Reiki, um, um, biofeedback and so on and so on, all kind of stuff that are uh, going to uh, shape the reality that we nowadays live in. And uh, Barbara Brennan, for instance, was a very famous author who wrote books on auras and chakras. And she was, uh, what my publisher at that time said, a little bit of a spooky figure. He was always a bit scared around her because she would peer so deep inside people. So it is not that there's not qualities of people inside them, but there are qualities of people that are exploited and also weaknesses of people of course are also exploited uh, because a commerce cannot thrive without making people weak and the more weak people are uh, the more gullible they become and the more easy it is to have your business uh, based on it and of course my own business is uh, based on that same history and trying to undo that history is part of the task of the download program so that we can make a little bit more of a common sense approach to medicine and healing and actually do some real work um, instead of uh, trying to become popular. We see in that time uh, also the re-emergence of uh, new Christian movements uh, like in the United States but also in Europe and you see also the rise of neo-paganism and so on and so on, all kind of movements that are uh, partly based, no they are largely based on a form of uh, Western exceptionalism uh, which in Europe is called American exceptionalism, but the Europeans have the same problem, so don't worry about it. The Chinese have the same problems, the Indians have the same problems, the Africans have the same problems, although they still have some issues to work out before they can actually make it work out. But you will see when Africa becomes a commercial success, it will have the same kind of uh, feeling. That is uh, just natural with anybody who is successful. You see the Russians having the same kind of problem also. Uh, it is human that if you are successful, you think you are... A chosen one. Uh, of course uh, there was this uh, neo-colonial ideas that uh, came in where people claimed pieces of other cultures without actually understanding them and making claims about them 
and as a result of that, you know, as a result of the lack of uh, openness about information, because we didn't have the internet yet, and there was not very much material published that could be researched, you could say a lot of things without having to really proving them, and that is still a little bit of an issue, it seems. And as a result of that, um, new kind of beliefs came in about about all kinds of cultures, which are difficult to debunk for these cultures themselves because they don't speak your language. And like people from American Indian movement, they were like city Indians, and they were debunked by the reservation Indians, and uh, they debunked the white people who are colonializing their ideas and walking around. And there is just layering and layering and layering uh, through which whole new belief systems come about and eventually they lead their own life and they will build up their own history and create generally also, uh, gradually also, their own validity. Uh, it's always difficult to stop uh, these kind of things. There is, after this development, there is more going on. And you see that nowadays when you look at YouTube, you look at Facebook, there's so many things going on. Uh, it is impossible to trust or to believe anything uh, or to, uh, to, to understand the scope of things. There are so many new things uh, being created. Like I just show you a few books that I have in my library. I don't buy that many books or for a long time. This actually is, a, I go, you have to read that, uh, vibrational medicine, uh, world medicine. These are all already books from the beginning of this century and uh, the end of the last century. Um, one of the things that happened in the 1980s is the book that I just showed you last uh, from uh, uh, Robert uh, E. Becker. Uh, he was a medical doctor who researched uh, the nervous system and the body electrical, the body electrical systems. And he developed a system of nervous uh, regrowth, especially from the spinal column he was researching. And as a result of that, a lot of people take his ideas in all kinds of formats uh, to develop uh, their ideas of healing. So they create a sort of a semi-scientific uh, ID. Uh, Becker's ideas were only partly followed up by research and some of them were confirmed, some of them were not confirmed. Um, it, it is something that is probably still in progress. I didn't keep track of uh, how his ideas were developing in the modern time. Interesting though is that it is followed up to a large degree by a group of French scientists which started embedding chips inside the bodies uh, to open doors and to deal with their TVs and computers and stuff like this. There's a lot of research in that research direction going on by reading brain waves and managing your computer through brain waves um, so that uh, people who are paralyzed can still function in society in regular jobs. Um, this movement also creates this uh, specific fringe, which is called transhumanism, where people try to become like the Borg in Star Trek and integrate machinery and computers and stuff like this in themselves uh, more directly. And that movement now has been a little bit sidetracked because of the invention of CRISPR, where people um, go manipulate genes so that uh, people can be manipulated to have all kinds of qualities that maybe normally by nature would not uh, develop like uh, infrared eyes or something like this. Um, I'm not exactly sure what people want to do with it. The objection against these kind of sciences is that people very often they don't really know what it is to be human. They have only partly developed their humanness or all their human capacities. Uh, and they, the integration with technology or the adaptation or with uh, genes, uh, gene hacking is to a large degree uh, lazy men's uh, science in the sense that they are they want to sidetrack uh, natural abilities uh, by replacing them by mechanical things but it is like with horses and cars you can buy a Maserati but it isn't a horse uh, there is just no comparison the Maserati can be nice color can be nice shape whatever uh, personally I don't have any feelings for cars um, but you know, it doesn't do things as well as a horse. A horse is just much more efficient, but not as fast. I must admit that. Uh, so Maserati is much more fast, uh, but, you know, it still is an ugly thing. Uh, it is not a living thing, so it doesn't really fit into what actually makes us grow as human beings. Um, although having a horse as a pet in front of your door is maybe also not very practical with such a big population as we have nowadays. So, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, all directions, of course, 
uh, in that sense, to quote a very famous person. Um, you see on the internet uh, other forms of interpretation of this energy body thing, and that is that the universe is electrical with the work of, uh, for instance, the Thunderbolt project. I will give you a link also in the article in the Patreon post, and also some debunking, uh, because uh, they make the claim that uh, people like Einstein, of course, were wrong, and that the world is not built on gravity, but on electricity, and I personally, I have a hard time in uh, saying like this is right or that is wrong, not because I don't understand the science of either side, uh, they both make sense sometimes, um, although one side makes more sense than the other one, but I also try to show how uh, gravity is not as relevant when you see it, for instance, in a Taoist perspective where I explained that in the uh, the idea of uh, Taoism, uh, heaven emanates a particular kind of force going downward to the earth, impregnating the earth, and uh, the earth then generates all the objects on the on the world. And what I explain it in the sense of gravity is that we do not experience gravity as a pull, but as a push. And I use it actually in my my my, my program uh, when I explain like, okay, when heaven expels you, then you're being pushed against the earth, and when you resist a pushing force is very different from your body than when you experience a pulling force because the one drags you down and the other one tries to stop you from going up uh, so if we will be able to resist the pushing force of heaven enough we could be flying and that's mainly what the mortals uh, are doing uh, so uh, when i use that it helps people to get a better posture and also feel more resilient and emotionally more stable so it's just a thing uh, that i use in my practice um, doesn't make it true, though uh, I am not the one to be able to judge that because I don't have the testing equipment to say that is true. I can make references to possibilities to do research, but that's all I do. I can do. And it is also the same with the Thunderbolt project. They can make references, but they don't actually do research, but they can prove with uh, facts. Although, though, they think they have the facts. When you look at all these kind of things, you can see, okay, there is this idea about the energy body. It is a typical Western concept, and it is a theoretical framework which is expanding and which is growing and uh, keeps people at work, it becomes an industry, and it uh, provides uh, some moral support, some emotional support, some physical support for people. It keeps people busy, so it prevents them from molesting policemen, I guess. And as a result of that, uh, they come to live in a world, in a reality of their own, and uh, find self-assurance for their existence and the importance of their existence. So this is all fine. This is all one thing. When it grows big enough, uh, like Machiavelli says, every government is a legalized criminal organization. So when they become big enough, they eventually take over the scientific uh, realm, and there will be a new world around there, and they will walk against their own walls, like science walks against its own walls. Like medicine walks against its own walls, like acupuncture walks against its own walls because of its westernization. And uh, as a result of that, uh, there will be new fringe things coming up. And you know, this is a, like a constant process of renewal that we can expect to happen. So yeah, sort of like I wanted to show this to to make you realize how it works. Because when acupuncturists say, like, you know, there's energy going through the body, uh, they probably didn't really research where the concept comes from and uh, why it is so important uh, to be debunking that idea. There's no energy going through the channels. In Chinese medicine, they're very clear in the uh, in all the texts from the past, they talk about meta water metabolism and uh, steaming over water and so forth and so forth, uh, through which uh, the yang qi can rise through the duma and through the yang channels and condenses at the end points and then comes back to the dang tian uh, through the ren mai and it actually collects in the bladder and uh, you know, all these kind of things, through which uh, you can say, okay, this is the Nidam process, it's a very simple process, it's like a percolation process, and as a result of that, uh, we gradually increase the quality of our body and the clarity of our body, and as a result of that, we gradually become more aware of everything that happens inside us, and we have more control over the different processes of our body, because we merge them with the processes of the different organs and so on. It's a long, 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 winding yellow brick road. It's a space for another video. But it has its own scientific model. It has its own production model. It has its own ideas about how things come about and why you don't need instrumentation for it. So why try to do things in a difficult way to get something that is less quality and less pronounced and less developed 
than the original model. It doesn't improve over time by associating it with something that it is not. Uh, every culture can only make criticism about another culture because it doesn't really understand another culture uh, and vice versa. So when Chinese medicine says something about Western science, it can only talk about, like, you know, it's nice that you talk about the nervous system and so on. We can see that. We can try to incorporate that within our theories, but we have to incorporate it within our theories. We should not incorporate our theories in our practices in your theory because, you know, your model is not better than ours because we also produce results. Of course, the new model also produces results, so we're not going to deny that because every model produces results. Uh, World Health Organization research in the 1990s showed that from all the different kind of theoretical models, uh, about 40 to 60 percent of the people have benefits from that. So it is not necessarily that uh, uh, anything is better than anything else. Western medicine doesn't produce like you know great results, but I still remember the 1980s when we saw Qigong research uh, emerging, where they said like they had like a 80. 89% uh, success rate, or they have 99% success rate, stopping smoking with acupuncture, 89-98% uh, success rate, and so on and so forth. Continuously falsifying research results. When you saw the emergence of uh, Qigong, and uh, of course our modern model of uh, Chinese medicine uh, as based on that, uh, you saw that they were the result of the influence of Western esoteric movements uh, like uh, uh, spiritism, uh, magnetism, and so on and so on, through Hong Kong and Beijing and Shanghai, which were major entry points, uh, Tianjin, uh, major, major entry points for Western thoughts into China. And they were brought in to that country and they were seen as, you know, like marvelous new inventions and developments. But as it goes in China, one generation further, uh, people do not have enough historical uh, understanding and they claim it to be their own. And now we are importing Qigong and so on, all kinds of practices, and we claim that they are like a 5,000 year old practice because the Chinese say that. Well, in fact, uh, there is clear historical reference uh, from research from Hong Kong and other places. These things originate in Europe. And you can see books from the 19th century in France, in the Netherlands, in England, in America, that show all the exercise that we nowadays call Qigong. Uh, as part of uh, magnetic healing and magnetic passes and so on and so on. So I don't understand why people can't look back into the historical time. All the great thinkers uh, of any culture that were showing the falsehoods of their time, they were all historians. Uh, we talk about Lao Tzu, Confucius, we talk about uh, Hindu, Hindu wise people, Buddhist wise people, uh, we talk about African wise people, we talk about Jewish wise people, we talk about Christian wise people. All these people, they all studied history and they saw that gradually over time people were into a sort of a cultural drift, moving away from the original ideas of their culture and as a result of that losing their empowerment and as a result of that losing what in Chinese would be called the mandate of heaven and as a result of that actually die off and have to make place for something else. So. This was actually this video about uh, the public secret of uh, the energy body uh, and that especially in relation to Chinese medicine. And of course it is also a plea for our fast track program where you are free to use any theory you like uh, as long as you report on it. Uh, we ask you to be part of our research program because uh, this is the way how we gradually improve our uh, project also. But as soon as you start also doing our Chinese medicine project we are very strictly adhering to the Chinese medicine theory. We do not allow you to take the uh, westernization as a core value, but we have to actually signify you a little bit in that uh, sense. Of course, I'm not going to ask you to become Chinese or Taoist or anything else like that, but you have to understand the core concepts to understand to how to work with it. And then, of course, once you are busy with your career, you can again do whatever you want, but within the study program, you have to first absorb uh, the original Chinese model and that is also not the TCM model that is nowadays popular uh, because you know there's political economic and whatever kind of values behind it that have reformed it and reshaped it and it's the same with Japanese medicine, Korean medicine and Vietnamese medicine whatever they say so let's try not to be commercial let's try to be smart and let's try to appreciate the difference between different cultures 
and uh, I look forward to see you in the next video and uh, if you would like to support this video give it a like uh, subscribe uh, maybe join our patreon come study with us in any kind of level or just support us uh, you can also add a uh, uh, donation just for one time i'll put it in the patreon page uh, to go with this so that you can add that thank you very much